Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Over the last few decades, thousands of citizens from Micronesian countries have settled legally in the US and especially Hawaii, but many say they have faced ill treatment in their new homeland. I'm Malika Bilal. Today we'll discuss the experiences people are sharing online under the hashtag being Micronesian. Send us your questions and your comments via Twitter and our YouTube chat. My name is Lee Francis the fourth. I am the CEO and founder of the Indigenous Comic Con, and you are in the stream. Hawaii's reputation is best summed up by its popular greeting, aloha, a word meaning love or compassion, yet many Micronesians living there have suffered racism and discrimination. That sparked a wide-ranging online discussion about what it means to be Micronesian in the United States. Milika. Thanks, Femi. Most of the online vitriol is directed at people who came to Hawaii from Palau, the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. Now, citizens of these countries can live in the U.S. under an association agreement. The online conversation over the treatment of Micronesians in Hawaii was started by a Palauan podcaster and activist. Under the hashtag being Micronesian, she showed examples of racism and discrimination. Shaw Ungolungal says being Micronesian means watching a steady stream of hate, such as being compared to cockroaches. In one example, a Twitter user calls Micronesians stupid, lazy, promiscuous, unreliable, and entitled. Now, Victa is among those from Micronesia who responded to the hashtag. He says he used to live on the U.S. East Coast and that people there didn't even know Micronesia exists. When he moved to Hawaii, he thought he would be welcomed as a fellow Pacific Islander. But instead, he found being Micronesian in Hawaii means people hate something about you without knowing you. Now, as the hashtag grew wider attention, Anita Hofsteiner at Honolulu Civil Beat wrote an article about the Twitter conversation. She followed up with an essay on why talking about anti-Micronesian hate is important. But while she received strong support for the articles, some people's attitudes are hard to change. Anita tweets one reader who said her Micronesian neighbors are filthy, uneducated, and disease-ridden, and that they're taking over Hawaii. Femi? There's so much to talk about. Sha Ongo Lungo, who studied the BA Micronesian hashtag, joins us from Honolulu. Also in Honolulu, we have Anita Hofschneider. She's a journalist on Civil Beat. That's an online news site. And she wrote those articles that we mentioned earlier that gathered so much attention in Hawaii and beyond. And in Portland, Oregon, we have Kathy Jetnil Kitchener. She is a Marshallese poet, artist, and activist, and she also co founded a nonprofit dedicated to finding solutions to climate change and other environmental issues threatening the Marshall Islands. Ladies, it's good to have you here. Uh, Shah, as we were doing that first little chunk, and uh, Malika was in that first little chunk, your face was just changing uh, in terms of passion and steam coming out of your head. I could, I could feel it. But this <laughs> idea of uh, Micronesians going into the US and particularly into Hawaii, why would they go in the first place, Shah? Because of the Compact of Free Association, which um, at least for Palau, we became a sovereign nation in 1994. But in free association, it gave the people of Palau the ability to come to the United States. We don't have to necessarily get things like green cards or mm. really work on work visas. It was just we can come to the United States, we can work, we can attend school, and the same kind of in other Micronesian countries. It's, sure. And Hawaii is the obvious place to go because it's kind of an in-between. But it's you, not quite as big as the United States, but... Sure. So, so it was open, open to Micronesians to go to Hawaii, to go to the rest of the U.S., but why would they want to? The invitation yeah. was there, but why? Yeah. Um, the pursuit of higher education, mm. better medical care, just the opportunity to do better. Um, I know in Palau, minimum wage would be, I believe, around $3 an hour right now. They don't, they have a college, Palau Community College, but um, only recently did they start, I think, being able to pursue graduate degrees and um, I think even doctorates, but it's online education. Mm. And then in terms of medical care, we just don't have that kind of healthcare in Palau. So being able to come to Hawaii is really a lot of opportunities. 
I hear what you're saying there, and I think that this member of our community would agree. This is Angela, who says, I'm Chamorro, uh, which is a member of an indigenous uh, uh, community from the Mariana Islands. There are now about as many Chamorros living in Hawaii and the U.S. mainland as there are living in Guam and the northern Mariana Islands. And in a few years, the diaspora will be larger. He goes on to say, those of us in the U.S., I'm in Washington, D.C., are trying to make a living as well as we know how, and we want to have our kids do well, just like every everyone else living in this country. So Anita, for some of our audience who are not completely clear on why people might leave uh, these islands, as, as, as Shaw was explaining there, and Angelo does here as well, what do you hear from people you talk to? Sure, well, there are lots of reasons why people would leave. Um, one of them is job opportunities, and that's one of the ironies of the discrimination against Micronesians in Hawaii. There's this perception that they don't wanna work, that they're lazy, and the reality is, while I'm sure there's some people who are lazy, there's also many, many people who are hardworking and who are you know, trying to just come to the U.S. because this is a good place for opportunities. For example, I spoke with one Chukis woman who um, is a housekeeper in Waikiki, and she was saying that she came to Hawaii because there were no jobs in Chuk, and she really just wanted to earn money to support her family. Um, and so I think you can't um, emphasize enough the types of job opportunities that are here. And, um, you know, the um, person on Twitter, Angela Villagomez, he is Chamorro just like me, and I'm Chamorro from Saipan. And I came um, to the U.S. Um, for education and for jobs. And so it's, it's all very similar. And one thing that is the difference is that if you are Chamorro from Guam or the Northern Mariana Islands, you are a U.S. citizen. So no one really questions my ability to be here or my right to be here, and nobody calculates how much I'm using in terms of social services. But it's very different for people from Micronesian Islands that chose to maintain their sovereignty and be in free association with the U.S. And so the reception you get here is very different. Kathy, I want to show you a tweet that's from the Being Micronesian hashtag. Let me share this with you. Sean Spondike says, I swear Micronesians have more drama than any other race. These people always get drunk, start fights with their families and anyone just walking around. I'm so over this. Where does that attitude come from? Um... I'm not sure where that attitude comes from. I mean, I think that there's definitely an issue of alcoholism within some of our community members, but it, there's an issue of alcoholism with other um, communities as well. And I think it just has to do with being the latest wave of immigrants to Hawaii, or at least that's what it looks like, because actually there is documented records of Micronesians coming into Hawaii during the plantation era. But um, we're the latest immigrants now, and so there's this misunderstanding between our communities of why are they here, where are they coming from. And then I think at a state level, uh, it's contributing to that kind of hatred because there's all of these you know, news reports coming out saying you know, Micronesians are benefiting off of the state and they're costing us this amount of money, and then that trickles down to personal interactions and conversations like and perspectives like the one that was just, you know, that you just read from that tweet, yeah. I want to share another one. This It's also hard to hear and hard to read. Um, this person tweets in uh, that he remembers feeling that discrimination during high school, his freshman year in Hawaii. He says, it changed something in me. After hearing local peers cracking jokes about Micronesians being ugly, having too many kids, referring to them as cockroaches, I never again referred to myself as Micronesian in front of anyone who wasn't. He yeah. goes on to say, though, that that's changed for him and this hashtag has helped he says i used to tell people i'm palauan to avoid all the micronesian stigma but i am a micronesian too and i will stand with anyone who identifies as such you corner a roach will true will chew through you so uh, defiance there hashtag being micronesian but shah as i read that i could see you kind of shaking your head there what has this done for younger generations of people who hear things like you are a cockroach you do not belong here you are a leech on society I actually had this, I had a different experience from a lot of Micronesians because I was born and raised in Oregon. And so I grew up in a place where I knew my community, I knew the Micronesians there. No one really thought anything of it. And then I came to Hawaii for college. And as an 18 year old, I discovered this. And so I, I learned right away and my classmates and I've seen it with younger Palauans and other Micronesians coming in. When, you, when you're asked where you're from, be very specific. My cousins told me when I applied for a job, uh, tell them you're from Oregon. 
if they press it, say you're Palauan, but whatever you do, don't say you're Micronesian because they won't hire you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Shao and Anita, you, you both have this experience of um, being able to hear the prejudice without people realizing that the people they're being rude about <laughs> is the person they're talking to. So this mm -hmm. idea of looking Micronesian, uh, first of all, Anita, tell me what looking Micronesian even means. What is that look? <laughs> Because <laughs> they obviously I got actually, it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I actually don't know what looking Micronesian means. Yeah. I mean, these are islands that have long histories of colonization. And so, for example, my last name's Hofschneider. So I'm part German, but I, that was many generations ago. And so I think a lot of people in the islands have similar experiences of, of having some, you know, a German last name or some European connection. Um, and so everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people tend to look mixed. And so... Uh -huh. um, what I take when people say to me, you know, you don't look Micronesian or um, you're too pretty to be Micronesian is Ooh. that it's kind of some kind of uh, discrimination against um, people who are darker skin than me. And, um, and, and that's also just this really indicative of the way that um, discrimination against Micronesians is so socially acceptable in Hawaii that people feel comfortable that they can say that to you to your face. It's, it's really, it was really quite astounding when I moved here. Wow, so you don't even have to eavesdrop a little bit because I know, Shah, you've heard conversations, you've been in conversations where people don't realize that you are Micronesian, correct? Yeah. Uh, tell Very us about many. one. Yeah, tell, tell us what one that really stands out. Um, I, was, I was just standing around with acquaintances on a lunch break and one of their friends had come up and began just talking about his weekend and he just went off like these Micronesians were doing this and my neighbors and they're such trash. And I stopped the conversation to say, hi, I'm Micronesian. And because we were in an area where there's all cafes and eateries around us, the first thing he said was, oh, which restaurant do you work in? Ooh. Wow. Because there's this, this stereotype here that if you're Micronesian, you work washing dishes, sweeping floors, janitorial, um, food service. And I had to point out that I was a I I was the gallery director of the art gallery we were standing next to, and he didn't believe it until he watched me unlock the door. No. I, I like the point that you're bringing up there because I think what I'm hearing from people online is that many people, as you said, uh, don't believe that Micronesians are contributing to society enough. So this is a comment we just got live on YouTube from Dehi, who says, we work and pay taxes into the system while still often being forbidden from using services. People continue to discriminate, and the only logical explanation is xenophobia. But it's that part about talking about using services and paying into the system that I want to focus on, because we heard from a doctor in Hawaii who talks about why this matters for people's day-to-day -day lives. He wrote this piece for Honolulu Civil Beat, How an Oahu Doctor Struggles to Care for His Micronesian Patients. And here is what he told the stream. In 2008, with the Great Recession, the state of Hawaii, in an attempt to save money, removed compact migrants from Medicaid rolls. A legal battle ensued and their participation was reinstated but they were finally kicked off of Medicaid in 2015. This has made it very difficult uh, for me as a family physician to take care of them. Anita, can you explain a bit and what that hardship looks like for people? Sure. Um, you know, one thing that's um, important to know is that in, before 1996, uh, COPA migrants were eligible for all, all federal public benefits that other immigrants were eligible. But this changed in the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, and that shifted the burden for covering uh, health care for low-income people um, who are, happen to be COPA immigrants um, to the states. And so, you know, as Dr. Yamada pointed out, um, Hawaii has kind of bulked from uh, this responsibility in, around the time of the recession. They actually shifted COPA migrants to a different type of uh, insurance plan that many people in the community say actually, um, you know, cause people to leave the islands and just go home because they didn't want to um, stay in Hawaii if they weren't able to get that care. And, you know, that with the implication that if you go home, they, you'll pass away because there's not enough care there. Or they think that that helped uh, complicate people's illnesses because they weren't able to get the care that they needed. Um, so this, you know, it's very complicated um, and it's changed over time. But now um, the 
state provides subsidies for people who are getting on Obamacare, but the process is, is definitely convoluted. It's it's not very straightforward and it's it's difficult for people. And so um, it's so it's one of the examples of the institutional barriers that people face. So it's not just hate speech. It's also, um, for example, you have to renew your license every year in Hawaii um, if you are a COFA migrant instead of having five years the way that I do or the way somebody with a U.S. passport would. Um, you also, until recently, you couldn't serve on boards or commissions. Um, and that changed last year when um, a Chukis man joined the um, Civil Rights Commission. But there are just a myriad ways in which institutionally there are barriers if you are a COFA migrant here. Kathy, what occurs to me is in this situation where there's prejudice and people are really annoyed in Hawaii, Americans are really annoyed with Micronesians being in Hawaii, that there's some basic knowledge that has gone missing, that they don't understand that there is a deal between the U.S. and some Micronesian islands for their people to be able to come to the States and receive benefits because meanwhile back in their home there are nuclear experiments going on and using it as military bases etc so it's a deal let me give you one example here this is Hojo Leon and I'm just going to go a little further down into his uh, comment here and he says a hundred percent of low-income housing Micronesians and Hawaii allows this when they should not Hawaii wastes billions of Micronesians that don't put a dime into the system meanwhile US citizens, military veterans are still homeless. So this person obviously doesn't know about the deal. How do you change that, Kathy? Because this is an education uh, process. Because this is obviously uh, wrong. I, I think that um, there's a lot of ways to change that. I think that conversations like these that began from this Twitter hashtag, you know, that that, that Shaw began, that's actually a really great way to, to get that conversation going, you know. And then also the way that I personally change these kinds of uh, these kinds of perspectives is I, I or I try to is through poetry. And so one of the first poems I actually ever wrote and put up on YouTube is um, Lessons from Hawaii, which came from which was inspired by myself, my experience of growing up in mm -hmm. Hawaii and experiencing racism as a Micronesian, you know, and so I really think it's just conversations at this point, you know, and, and um, getting more of our community, the community in Hawaii aware of these links because nuclear testing was conducted in the Marshall Islands after World War II. They literally incinerated our one, like a, more than a few of our islands and one of them, Bikini Atoll, is still so contaminated we can't return. Kathy, and so that's a big contributing factor. Yes. Kathy, it feels like a good point to actually play a little bit of your poetry, a little bit of your work, there's also activism at the same time. This is a poem called Anointed. Have a listen, everybody. You were a whole island once. You were breadfruit trees, heavy with green globes of fruit, whispering promises of massive canoes. Crabs dusted with white sand scuttled through pandanus roots. Then you became testing ground. Nine nuclear weapons consumed you, one by one by one, engulfed in an inferno of blazing heat. You became crater, an empty belly. Kathy, does your work change people's minds? Do you feel that you're, you're having an impact with your poetry that you're doing? Um, I think so. I'd like to think so. Yeah. I think that uh, well, the way that that's dem been demonstrated to me in the past is I've performed these poems to audience members that included people who um, who knew Micronesians but weren't Micronesians, and they actually came up to me afterwards and said, thank you for sharing that poem about your experience of racism in Hawaii. I didn't think that really existed. You know, I didn't know that that was happening, or I felt that way too, and, you know, now I see how that's wrong. So I've actually had quite a few people come up to me to discuss that with me. And so in that way, um, I, I think it can contribute, at least in a small way, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not only the shared poetry um, being... A kind of bridge for communities that I'm hearing from online, but it's also shared history and shared language, and people want to remind others about. This is Oatmeal's Revenge, that's the handle. Uh, on Twitter, I went to an all-Hawaiian high school and heard X dresses and looks like a Micronesian, or worse, uses an insult like every week. Hawaii locals, including native Hawaiians, all have a responsibility to say something about it when our friends and families perpetrate this racism. So I want to share with you a comment from someone who is doing just that. This is Adam, who wrote a fairly long post on Facebook about uh, the the similarities between Polynesians and Micronesians, and he sent us a video comment that I want to share with you. Have a listen to this. 
People think that the Micronesians are different from us Hawaiians. That is not true. We are related by our languages and by the same ocean. We share the same ongoing colonial legacies, the same land issues, and the same issues on self-determination and climate change. As a Kanaka Maori, considering how long Micronesians actually have been in Hawaii, how they have helped us reclaim our own maritime identity, and the fact that they are our cousin Pacific Islanders, the hatred directed toward them is nothing short but un-Hawaiian. Sha, what do you think when you hear messages like that? Um, especially because it's Adam and I love Adam. So <laughs> that's, it's, I think for all the hate that went into creating the thread, the greatest part of it is how many people have come out as, as allies, as supporters, as people who are standing with us in solidarity, whether they're Hawaiian, Samoan, we have people who contacted us from Germany, uh, Brazil. It's just, I think that's been the most amazing part of this. And I always wanted to point out that, yes, there were a lot of native Hawaiians who had made these comments. However, in the grand like scheme of things, there have been more native Hawaiians who have come out in support than not. And I've still met more wonderful people here than I, than otherwise. And so I think it's, it's heartwarming and it gives me hope that yes, this is generally how systems of oppression work and one group will always kind of put down the other group, but at the same time, maybe we can shift that paradigm a little bit starting off. Sure, I'm just thinking because this compact, this deal between the U.S. and um, and some Micronesian states, that it's it's a it's about funding. It's a we give you this, you get that. It expires in 2023. I'm just wondering. It's not a perfect deal right now. Are, are, are there talks, negotiations about how you have a better relationship if Micronesians are being invited into the U.S.? How does that? How how do you have a good relationship when that happens? I tend to run along the um, rabble rouser end when it comes to discussing the compact, only because um, my personal area of interest is studying the compact and what led up to it. Mm. And so one of the things that I've tried teaching people since that, since the thread, and even before that, was the compact was never necessarily created as a way to benefit us as Micronesians. It was created as a way for the United States to hold on to these islands for military purposes. Uh -huh. And so um, in the 60s, which is when the Solomon Report came out, um, the Solomon Report was commissioned by President Kennedy. And that came right after the United Nations had issued Resolution 1514, which was saying that colonized lands needed to be returned to the indigenous people. Well, this was how they worked around it. They couldn't keep us as colonies, but they could convince us that free association was the best way to go mm. so that we could keep receiving funds and they could keep having access to them. It's really interesting so. to see what happens in 2023. It's not that far away. Yeah. It's um, really not. Yeah, that, that will tell you where the mindset of the Micronesian states is. Do they need American money? Are they OK about going forward without it? Or will it be renewed and we'll have another show like this? Shah. Anita, Kathy, thank you so much for bringing your insight into our show and, and sharing with us the prejudice that happens in some parts of America and Hawaii with people from Micronesia. Malika? I am going to share one other date with our audience here. This is from Mary Perez, who shares Wednesday, October 17th, 2018, the committee, uh, that's Hawaii Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, will hear testimony and firsthand accounts of discrimination against Kofa immigrants and Hawaii. She says, though used as a noun, hearing implies active listening. These hearings are a venue for voices of marginalized Micronesians to be heard and a chance for others to hear truth. In the land of Aloha and the country of the free and the brave, the truth of discrimination is real. All right, so that's all for today. But be sure to keep your comments coming. And you can use Twitter, YouTube, and outofzero.com forward slash the stream. Malika and I will always see you online. Bye-bye for now.